thank you all for being here uh, and for the closing of the winter meeting. We're really excited to have a, a really special closing keynote. Uh, Dr. Paul Borski is with us this afternoon or morning. I don't even know what morning it is. Um, and he's an associate professor of integrative studies in George Mason University School of Integrative Studies. And his full bio is available on our website. Um, he's led, he recently led the design and development of the new social justice and human rights undergraduate and graduate programs. He's also a senior research fellow for the Center for the Advancement of Wellbeing and is serving his third term on the board of the International Association for Intercultural Education. He's got a phenomenal website. Um, and we'll make sure that, that you all get a, a link to that. He created and continues to manage the Multicultural Pavilion. And it's a website that focuses on critical multicultural education. Um, so that's another resource that we'll make sure to send out that you all can have a chance to look at. Um, he lives in Virginia with his cat, Buster. And we're really excited to welcome Paul. Please welcome Paul Sikorsky. How are y'all doing? Good. How many of y'all been here since Wednesday? Oh, man. Y'all exhausted? Okay. Well, uh, so uh, this morning I'm going to talk with you about uh, the equity literacy framework that's designed, really, it's, in, in essence, it's designed to work with people who see themselves as having a deep commitment to educational equity and social justice and to push us to make sure that we have integrity uh, in, in the work that we're doing. And I want to say really quick a little bit about this title. Uh, one of the things that I've learned, one of the things that I found pretty interesting in going around to schools all over the country and, and uh, you know, when I go to these schools, if I go to whoever has the most power in the school and I say, well, do you all care about diversity and equity here? Of course, they say, yes, we're committed to it. And then I say, well, what are you doing in service to that commitment? And what I, what I have learned is that it's usually about at that point where the shift in the conversation goes from equity to cultural diversity. Because I'll say things like, well, we had the, uh, we had the multicultural arts and crafts fair last week. And uh, next week we have the mix it up at lunch day. And uh, so I said, well, no, what, what about equity? What are we doing about equity? But what's even more disturbing is if I go to these schools and I go to the people who are charged at those schools with taking the leadership on equity and diversity, uh, often in those conversations as well, I will bring up equity and they will start talking about cultural competence or they will start talking about cultural diversity or they will start talking about anything, it seems, that helps them get around to talking about equity and social justice. So I, uh, I worked with my colleague, Katie Swalwell, to develop the, this framework called the Equity Literacy Framework. I'm going to share a bit about that and the principles underlying it and uh, what that means for us as people who care about educational equity. But as a way to get started, uh, how many of you work in some function in uh, public schools? Okay, awesome. Yay, all right. Most of you. So I thought I'd start in a way that would make you all feel at home. So I made this little multiple choice standardized <laughs> assessment. And I figure if we could just get this out of the way at the very beginning, you won't have test anxiety and we can do all better. So there's no particular reason why you're going to know any of the answers to these questions. Another way of saying I have equally low expectations of everyone <laughs> in the room, but this will just get us to warm up a little bit. To, uh, what do we know about equity? So let's start with this question. The majority of people experiencing poverty in the U.S. live in, how many of you would say they live in urban areas? The majority live in urban areas, raise your hand. A few people, how many of you would say they live in suburban areas? Raise your hand. How many of you would say rural areas? Okay, it is rural areas. The fastest growing poverty right now is in suburban areas, which is a brand new phenomenon. This never happened before in the United States. I always want to remove this question from the quiz because I cannot say the word rural. Rural. 
Everyone say rural. rural. Okay, you can't say it. I can show you. There comes a point in language where you just got to eliminate a word. Nobody can say it. All right. How many of you have 100% on the quiz so far? It is, it is self-grading, so if you don't have 100%, then you should have been using a pencil. According, uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, how much more likely are African American and Latino mortgage applicants to be turned down for a loan than white applicants, even after controlling for employment, financial, and neighborhood factors? Who thinks it's 30% more likely? 60% more likely? 90% more likely? It is 60% more likely. Now, some people just pick the worst case scenario for each question. The world is so racist. 60% is still pretty freaking racist. Okay. Anybody have two for two? And this matters not at all, by the way, because it's totally random. But a Princeton study of elite universities found that legacy applicants, usually white and wealthy, people who have a parent or grandparent who attended the institution, are far more privileged by legacy status that applicants of color are by affirmative action policies. The study determined that, determines that legacy status was equivalent to how much of a boost to an applicant's SAT score. Who thinks it's a 20 point boost? I don't know, why would I have it on here if it's a 20 point? Who thinks it's a 90 point boost? Who thinks it's a 160 point boost? It is a 160 point boost. So if there's this is what I find really interesting. I mean, this is, this is what we have to understand about doing equity work. The reason we do equity work is because of this kind of injustice. So if our, the reason we do equity work is because access and opportunity are not distributed fairly, nor are resources distributed fairly. And this is an example of that. This is affirmative action for white people. That's what this is. This is affirmative action for white people. So if our equity work isn't about redistributing access and opportunity, in other words, if we're doing equity work and leaving that the way it is, that's really not equity work. In essence, that's not equity work. More about that to come. According to a study by the American Association of Physicians for Human Rights, what percentage of physicians report witnessing a colleague giving reduced care or refusing care to lesbian, gay, or bisexual patients? Who thinks it's 12%? Who thinks it's 32%? Who thinks it's 52%? Who thinks it's 72%? Couple snakes. It is 52%. Anybody have them all correct? A few of you? Okay. Last question. The three richest people in the world have as much wealth as, who thinks it's the eight poorest countries? Who thinks it's the 48 poorest countries? Who thinks it's the 308 poorest countries? It is the 48 poorest countries. If you chose the 308 poorest countries, I hope you're not a geography teacher. <laughs> Because there are 196 countries. Uh, and you wonder what's wrong with public education today. We have a room full of intelligent, caring educators who overestimate the number of countries by 50%. reason why you would know any of the answers to those questions. But I, I think in order, even if we're thinking about doing equity, even if your sphere of influence is one classroom, even if you see that as your sphere of influence, it is still really important to understand the bigger structural dynamics that we're working with, because those bigger structural dynamics are impacting our students and impacting our families. And they're even impacting us in the kinds of funding uh, that, our, that our schools uh, receive. We'll come back to all of that in a second. I, I just want to provide a little bit more context about my work. 
largely is focused on equity practice in educational institutions, equity and social justice. But really what I look at are gaps between philosophy and practice. In other words, gaps between what we say we're committed to and then what we're actually doing in service to those commitments. Gaps between best practice and actual practice. So gaps between here's what research has, here is what evidence tells us is going to work. And evidence can be a million different things. Evidence can be the narratives of the students. Evidence can be big quantitative studies. There are lots of things that evidence can be. But uh, gaps between what evidence tells us is actually going to work to create more equity and justice and what people are doing instead of what, uh, what uh, evidence tells us. Here's a quick, just a really quick um, ideological example of this. If you on the one hand, raise your hand if you, um, raise your hand if you think it would be awesome if we could eliminate educational outcome disparities for students experiencing poverty. Raise your hand if you think that's a good idea. Okay, as, as part of a bigger goal of equity work. Yeah, I was just doing this uh, talk in Pennsylvania that was all these uh, school administrators and district level administrators and I asked them that question and then I said, well, here's what you have to grapple with. Now, that was, this is like in the middle of very conservative um, central Pennsylvania. And then, we started, and then I said, well, it should not be possible for you to have that desire and not support fair wage campaigns and wealth equality. It should not be possible for you to have that belief and not support universal health care. It should not be possible for you to have that belief and not support affordable housing uh, measures. And here's the problem. This is what, where we this is where we get sort of um, sidetracked in our conversations in education around equity. What research actually shows are those are the three most important uh, causes of educational outcome disparities across socioeconomic status. So as long as we're just sort of piddling with little curricular frameworks, there's no way that that is going to affect educational outcome disparities in, in, in any sort of big way, right? So it's not that you have to, everyone's got to leave your jobs in education and go work on those issues, but if we're not working on equity work in schools, well, based on an understanding of that bigger context, then we're going to trip into a lot of problematic uh, stuff. So, uh, and then finally, I focus on uh, common pitfalls or how schools oper operationalize diversity or whatever language you're using uh, in ways that actually create more inequity. We'll talk about some examples of that. So, here's my goal, and this is the goal of equity literacy. What are the knowledge and skills I need to become a threat to the existence of inequity within my spheres of influence? When I walk into this school, what are the knowledge and skills that I need so that my presence in this space is going to be a threat to racism, is going to be a threat to economic injustice and to heterosexism and to ableism and to transphobia and to all of these different sorts of inequities and injustices that exist? What are the knowledge and skills that I need to be a threat? And that's where that culture piece does not, is, is not sufficient. Because if I know a little bit about this culture, a little bit about that culture, I guess that's useful in some context. But that is nothing like being able to recognize subtle forms of racial injustice. Being able to recognize subtle forms of uh, heteronormativity and how that plays out in schools. That's a whole different set of knowledge and skills. And without that set of knowledge and skills, the cultural competence really is still just inequity uh, in the end. But the second piece of this is, do I have the will? Because let's face it, there are many people in this room who have the knowledge and skills. But do we have the will? I mean, the first thing we have to grapple with is, it is really impossible to do equity work well and be liked by everybody. So if you have a problem with not being liked, now here's, as a white, as a white male, as a white heterosexual male, this is a, <coughs> sort of an elevated thing for me because it, because if I was up here saying the same thing as a person of color, there would be people who wouldn't like me just as soon as I walked into the room because of who I am, right? And so I, 
in essence, it's almost like working to make myself disliked. I have a term for this, I call it institutional likability, and we'll talk more about that later. But do I have the will? Do I have the will to do it? Uh, this is a lens. This is a philosophical lens, in some ways it's a theoretical lens. And it's not just a list of practical strategies. I think that's where we also trip up a little bit, is that we think of all of our work in education as practical strategies. Here's an example of this. How many of you in your education or professional development ever had a class or a workshop or something around learning styles, Richard? Look around the room. Keep your hands up and look around the room. How many millions of dollars have been wasted on that professional development work? Do you know what happened when researchers actually went to see whether it was effective to teach two learning styles? <clears throat> Completely ineffective. And what's even worse, when that was filtered through a diversity and equity lens, it looked like this. This week, we're going to talk about the African-American learning style. Next week, we're going to talk about the Latino learning style. After that, we'll talk about the Asian Pacific Islander. Raise your hand if you've ever seen Asia on a map. Well, you all haven't seen Asia on a map? Raise your hand if you've ever seen it. Now, think about, think about how ludicrous this is. The idea that all I need to know is that somebody's ancestors at some point came from the continent that has the two most populous countries in the world. And I can assume I know how they learn. Think about that. Think about, there were entire school districts that completely changed their pedagogical strategies on junk. On junk. With so much of that equity stuff. Uh, I don't know, why am I saying this? Oh yeah, practical strategies. <laughs> now, if I can't look at that and recognize it as junk, then uh, there's no way for me to come up with sensible practical strategies because I don't understand the problem I'm trying to solve. Right? And, and that's, that's the challenge. That's the challenge. Largely, this is ideological in the end. It's about ideology and it's about will. Can I see what I need to see? Am I willing to see it? And then, am I willing to act on it? I don't know. That whole part was only supposed to take like 25 seconds, and now I'm like 15 minutes in. Okay. So here's a few sort of reflections to get us thinking about this as an ideological problem. If you had to guess, what is the most important indicator of how successful a teacher will be um, teaching students who are experiencing poverty? What would you guess would be the most important indicator? Yeah, just the absolute belief that they can succeed. Okay, belief that they can succeed. What else? Personal connection. Personal connection. Any other guesses? High expectations. High expectations. Good. Good guess. You all are sort of capturing something that falls uh, under the the, uh, co the uh, correct answer. So when I wrote this book, reaching and teaching students of poverty, I read about 25 years of research about poverty and education and all of these sorts of things. And what I was most interested in was this. What, what do we need to know about teachers and administrators and their belief systems? And what I found, based on the research, was that the most important thing was how a teacher would answer that question, that second question. And this is basically how it fell out. If I say to you, why are people who are experiencing poverty experiencing poverty? And the first thing that you think of is something that's wrong with people experiencing poverty. They don't care about education, their parents are this and that. Basically what the research says is you cannot be an effective teacher for low income students. Why? Because how are you supposed to develop positive relationships with people you think are broken? How are you supposed to have high expectations for somebody who you think is broken. And we can do the same thing across race as well. If you think what we need to do to address the racial, racial outcome disparities in school is to fix people of color, then you probably should not be in a classroom with people of color. And actually, you probably shouldn't be in a classroom, uh, ultimately. Now, believe me, I know we're all on a path here. We're all on the path. So maybe you just need a professional development workshop on itself, and then, or maybe five years of those, and then 
uh, we put you in a classroom. But, but that's the problem. And that's a purely an ideological piece. There are no amount of practical strategies that will help a white supremacist teacher effectively teach students of color. There are no amount of practical strategies for that. Right, so think about this. If you have any control over professional development in your school or district, it's got to focus first on belief systems and ideology, and then, and then use that to inform the conversation about practice. I'm spending way too long on each slide. OK, so here's a um, story time. So uh, two of those stories that kind of reflect on that first story. I was doing uh, some focus groups. One of the things that my organization at Change does, or at least used to do, is these equity assessments. So we were at a school. This is in the northeastern part of the U.S. And we were doing a, we were doing a focus group of students of uh, color at this school. And we asked them, well, how do you feel about the equity initiative here and how things are going around the race? And we heard things like, I feel like a visitor at my own school, one of the students said. One of the students said, I feel hyper-visible and I feel invisible. Right? Like during February or any time slavery comes up in the curriculum, I feel hyper-visible. The rest of the time, I feel pretty invisible. So we're talking and talking. And then a student slams her fist on the table and says, there's racism at this school, and nobody's doing anything about it. There's racism at the school, and nobody's doing anything about it. Right after that focus group, uh, we went into a focus group of the upper level administrators at the same school. We posed the same question. The head of the school, perfectly nice guy, former diplomat, he seemed to care about his students, was wearing that tie. I'm pretty sure he wanted that in the assessment report, right? What's going well? Principal wears diversity tie. <laughs> Principal wears somewhat obnoxious, stereotypical, actually, this is not going well at all. Yes. So he's wearing that tie. So we go in and we pose this question. And he leans back in his chair and he says, what we need to do here is celebrate the joys of diversity. And because I think in gaps, I said, that's your gap. Because we just came from a focus group with the least powerful people at your school. And what they said was, they're experiencing racism, and you aren't doing anything about it. And what you're saying, and this is kind of that advantage view versus disadvantage view. If your notion of equity is celebrating diversity, that's an advantage view, and it's an oppressive view. Because the problem is, you have, student, you have students in your school who feel like they are crossing a border every time they walk into the school. And you have students who feel that with individual uh, classrooms. But Equity literacy is learning how to recognize the difference between that. Celebrating diversity does not solve racism. Celebrating diversity while ignoring racism is racism. You see, that's equity literacy, is knowing the difference there. This was another school. This is a school in Virginia, and I got a call from the, one of the deans. His name is John. John is a very well-intended guy. His, his office is like a shrine to diversity posters. He's got the whole unity through diversity thing right behind him. He's got the little safe space sticker there on the door. So John calls me up and he says, we have a race problem here. We can really use your help. So I said, OK. So I went to the school and he said, I said, well, what's the problem? And he said, follow me. He marches down and swings open the doors of the laboratory of race relations in every high school, which is what? The cafeteria. So we walk in the cafeteria. Uh, this particular school has a big uh, uh, population of uh, Hmong students whose families came over uh, as refugees. And so there was a table of uh, Hmong students sitting in the front of the cafeteria. Off to the left, there were two tables of African-American students sitting together. And John points to these tables and he says, the problem here is that the students of color segregate themselves. So I look and I see the one table of Hmong students and two tables of African American students, and there are 15 tables of all white students. And I say, well, it looks to me like the white students are segregating themselves. And his response, and I'm going to give him credit for this, his response was, you know what? I've never seen it that way. And I said, that's your gap. You better learn how to see it that way, because you know what he was going to do? His idea was to have seating charts for the cafeteria. 
So he was going to make these Hmong students who are being bullied by those white students go and sit with the white students. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that uh, in just a second, right after this third story. How many of you are familiar with Mix It Up at Lunch program? Okay. Diverse Friends Day is like an offshoot of Mix It Up at Lunch. I was at the, this is a middle school in Minnesota, I'm trying to make my way around the country with my stories here. And I was there the day before they were going to do this thing called Diverse Friends Day, which basically was that students were challenged. They had this same sort of uh, racial separation in the lunchroom thing going on. So they were going to develop this program that said, okay, so tomorrow at lunch, everybody has to sit during lunch with somebody with whom they haven't sat, they haven't sat with before at lunch. And that was their way of trying to integrate the cafeteria. So I'm talking with these group, this group of students. Uh, they're Latina, African American, uh, mostly. And I'm asking them, well, what do you think about this? And a couple of them were just, eh, who cares? One of them said basically, well, that they're telling me I gotta go sit with the kids who don't like me, one of them said. And another one said, uh, another one of them said, well, I think Diverse Friends Day is for white people. And I said, you, you're right. It is for white people. Because students of color do not need to sit with white people to learn about how race operates in their school. They got, they got it pretty well figured out. And this is another problem with a lot of diversity initiatives that really they're for white people to learn from people of color. And we gotta look at our initiatives like that. Really, who are these for? If this is about people of color coming together with white people to have some dialogue and some celebration with no guarantee that anybody's going to address that there's racism here and nobody's doing anything about it. That means that's for white people. And that's for taking on racism directly and specifically, taking on heterosexism directly and specifically. Then really what we're doing is recreating in our diversity efforts the same thing that already exists everywhere else. This is, this is equity literacy, knowing the difference. And I think part of the, I think this is part of the problem here, is that so many of the, diver, the frameworks that we have for thinking about equity and diversity are based around fairly vague notions of culture. Now, some of these frameworks, like cultural responsiveness and the stuff that Gloria Latson Billings and folks like that are doing, there's equity embedded in those models. The problem is when they get put into practice in schools, often that equity piece is taken out, and then it just becomes about cultural diversity. This last one confuses me the most, culturally and linguistically diverse. Everybody is culturally and linguistically diverse compared to other people. Nobody is culturally and linguistically diverse as an individual person. If, if what we're talking about is people who are culturally and linguistically marginalized, then let's use the word marginalized so that we know what we're talking about. Culturally, linguistically diverse, that doesn't mean anything. And just like, uh, are any of you at school districts that use uh, inclusive excellence as your framework? This is the new thing, inclusive excellence. It's like, let's take the two vaguest terms in the education lexicon <laughs> and push them together, and nobody will know what the hell we're talking about. I think that's the but again, it's not that there isn't value. I came through multicultural education as my framework. And Christine Sleater's book, uh, Multicultural Education and Social Activism, was like the first transformative book for me that I read in education. So some of these, so it's not about the frameworks themselves, but it's about how they get implemented as fluffy sort of cultural uh, things. And it's just an example. Uh, Moyer and Clymer are two school administrators who write about diversity using this culture linguistically diverse. And they talk about racism in schools as a problem, but look at what they offer as a solution. So they offer racism as a solution to racism. And this is, this is the, the, the problem that, that, that we have here. Some of it is just also about how we apply notions of culture. Often the problem is defined as the culture of marginalized groups. This is the whole Ruby Payne thing, if any of you are familiar with Ruby Payne. What we have to do is fix the mindsets of people in poverty, or fix the cultures of people in poverty. It's about fixing marginalized people, 
instead of fixing the conditions that marginalize people, which is what equity work ought to be about. Also, just in terms of how it's applied, it's often used as a replacement. If we're going to talk about race, let's just name race. If we're going to talk about the, uh, the uh, linguistic oppression that English language learners experience, let's name that as what we're talking about, instead of saying culture. Because culture doesn't seem like an issue that's going to be resolved by racial justice. And racial injustice certainly is not going to be resolved by focusing on culture. It's only going to be resolved by focusing on racial injustice. And then, of course, cultural programs often require people who are marginalized to engage with people who benefit from things like racism and heterosexism and sexism, even as their marginalization is ignored. So if we have one of these programs where we sort of parade around a group of uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender students to do talks and we're doing that, but we're not also working on structural, heteros structural heterosexism, then really we're just exploiting people. We're allowing people with privilege to build their cultural capital on the backs of people who experience oppression without addressing the oppression. So I'm not saying, you know, with this whole we need equity literacy more than cultural competency, I'm not saying we should eliminate culture as a consideration but that we should stop using culture when we mean something else. If we mean racism, let's say racism. If we mean culturally and linguistically marginalized, let's say marginalized. Let's say it so we can deal with it. And stop focusing on culture at the expense of focusing on inequity. Now, what this might mean for your school district, I know a lot of school districts or colleges and universities have a person or an office that's like the diversity person. So this person runs the cultural programs, the Black History Month stuff, all of that, that's fine. But there also needs to be a person or an office who's working on equity, and that should not be the same person in office. Because what happens when it is combined is that the people doing that have to spend so much time on this cultural programming that they don't have time left for this other stuff. And I think that's pretty purposeful, actually. I think that's pretty purposeful. The equity experts should not be doing cultural programming. Someone else can do cultural programming. The equity uh, experts ought to be doing equity work. So here's the sort of, sort of gets us to this question. Do we practice diversity, equity, social justice, inclusive excellence in ways that colonize or in ways that decolonize? Do we attempt to diversity in ways that make us a threat to inequity or do we do it in a way that makes us a threat to the possibility of equity? That's a hard question. Because I know that a lot of us are really proud of the diversity things that we've done, and that's great. Be, be proud of them. But we can also use these little measuring sticks to help assess how transformative we are. And I mean, this is basically, when in doubt, just throw up a quote of Martin Luther King Jr., let him do a little bit of the work. I'm, I'm exploiting Martin Luther King Jr.'s labor here, his intellectual labor. But this is what he's talking about. It is impossible to be a moderate equity advocate. If you're moderate, you are not invested in equity. You can't be invested in equity as a moderate. You can't be, because as a moderate, you're too worried about making sure everyone's safe and comfortable and happy. But it doesn't mean there aren't ways to be strategic about doing equity work. There are ways to be strategic. I don't want you all to get kicked out of your jobs and fired and have nobody left doing the equity work. Um, but we'll talk about we'll talk about some of that. I'm going to skip this because I already said it. Well, I won't skip this part. So here is I think the result of ideological failings. When I go around to schools, K-12, higher ed, one of the things that I find in most schools and districts is it's actually easier to be a teacher who doesn't care at all about inequity and just goes on implicitly contributing to inequity. It's easier to be that than it is to be someone who's outspoken. That people who are outspoken are actually punished harder than the people who are actually doing the inequity. And that is evidence of a sick institution. That is evidence of a sick institution. 
And so think about, in your spheres of influence, about that. There, there are schools that will create committees to work on diversity. Usually those committees just rewrite the diversity statement every year. It's like, how can we keep the people who care about this busy not doing equity work? But often on those committees, purposefully, the people with the most knowledge and passion are not invited because they're seen as troublemakers. They're seen as troublemakers. Not the people actually doing the inequity, not the people who are actually uh, uh, sending more African-American kids to the office than white kids for the same behaviors. They're seen as less of a problem than the person who's naming that as a problem. That's, that is a sick institution. We're, we're, here, we're here to do some healing of that sick institution. So here's our first test, building our equity literacy. This is sort of what I've already talked about, but if inequity is an unequal or unfair distribution of access and opportunity, including material and non-material, equity requires a redistribution, not a mitigation, not an add-on program, but a structural redistribution of access and opportunity. So here's the measuring stick. You go back to your school and your district, you look at the equity initiatives, and if you cannot say this is how this initiative is permanently redistributing access and opportunity across students, across different demographics, then it's time to start over with the equity work, or it's time to build onto the next thing. It's got to be about redistributing, not an add-on, not, oh, we're having problems getting uh, uh, young women into advanced math and into STEM stuff, so we're just going to do this extra program in the summer for young women. That's not equity. Equity is figuring out why you're having that problem and fixing that, you see. That's the redistribution. So in the end, inequity plus celebrating diversity plus cultural competence equals inequity. If that's where we're stuck, if that's where we're stuck, we're still at inequity. So, and let me be clear about this. I don't have any big problem with some of the, I mean, some of the, when I was in elementary school, the diversity program was taco night. I'm pretty sure we can do without taco night. A bunch of kids singing La Cucaracha, and uh, it was obnoxious. They couldn't even get the tacos right because the tacos were in these crunchy shells that I have yet to find in six trips to Mexico. Uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe in Mexico, when they when they see a gringo coming, they hide all the crunchy shells. They're like, they're like. Uh, but I mean, if you're gonna do taco night, get the tacos right, please. But uh, but there are other initiatives that can be good that can be good initiatives, uh, that can be strong initiatives that are that are about diversity and celebrating diversity and that sort of thing. But those are problematic for not also doing this other work. Those become more meaningful when we're doing the other work. Okay. Wow, well, I gotta hurry up. So I want to talk about a few uh, critical concepts that I think can help us take stock of our equity initiatives. Um, and, and this, and so the first one I'm going to talk about is sort of these diversity ideologies. And the reason why uh, I, you keep hearing me talk about ideology. What's really important about ideology or worldview or perspective taking is that my ideological perspective informs my understanding of a problem or a situation. My understanding of the problem impacts the results I can even imagine. I mean, the, the uh, responses I can even imagine for that problem. So here's a fact. A study by the Department of Ed found that black students were disciplined at a far high, far, at far higher rates than white students. That's a fact. Everybody in the room knows that's a fact. <clears throat> but ideologically speaking, it's critical if we're going to address that problem to, to take stock of how we understand that fact. Because if I just went out into Denver and found the first 100 white people I could find and presented them with that fact, what a majority of them would say would be, well, of course. African-American students are misbehaved more than white students. In the same way people look at the preponderance of people who are in prison for drug offenses, and they say, well, of course, African-Americans and 
Latinos and other people of color do drugs more than white people, so of course they're more than in prison. In fact, both of those are untrue. Research has shown that really this is about racism. What happens is that white teachers primarily, when a student of color does something, misbehaves, or they interpret it as a misbehavior, and for the first problem is they're much more likely to interpret something as a misbehavior more quickly in a student of color that they wouldn't even interpret as misbehavior in a white student. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that, that white teachers attribute misbehavior in students of color to their race. And so, in essence, all students of color are punished when, uh, over the long term when one student of color misbehaves. And that doesn't happen with white people. White teachers do not attribute white people misbehaving as a problem with white people. Right? And so what happens is, research has shown that that students of color doing the same behavior are much more likely to be referred, much more likely to be suspended, or kicked out of school, or, or some other way that they're gonna actually miss class time than, than white students for the same behavior. But if I don't know that, and I'm about fixing this as a problem, what I'm gonna think is, well, we gotta get these students of color to behave. That's deficit ideology. Deficit ideology is the belief that if you look at any hierarchy of power or achievement or whatever, that people at the top are there because they deserve to be there, and people at the bottom are there because they deserve to be there. Why do low-income kids not do as well in schools or wealthier peers? Their parents don't care about education, they're lazy, they're criminals, they're drug addicts. That's deficit ideology. That's the Ruby Payne model. So what do we do? We gotta fix the mindsets or cultures of people experiencing poverty instead of fixing the oppressions. The oppressions that actually cause poverty to begin with in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. But that's deficit ideology. So think about this. Are your initiatives for equity and diversity about fixing marginalized people, fixing English language learners? Fixing low-income parents. So another great example of this is thinking about, you know, another fact is that low-income parents on average don't show up for family engagement opportunities at the same rate as their wealthier peers. That's a fact. We've all seen it. It's a fact. Why does it exist? Because what most schools are doing in response to that is, well, let's invite all those parents into the auditorium and we'll lecture them about why they should care more about their kids' education. And now I've messed up two things. One, I'm trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Because low-income parents don't care about their kids' education, that's a problem that doesn't exist. We've known that since studies going back to the 1970s. Low-income parents, parents of color, yellow parents, all parents care about education. That's what the research says. All parents care about education. But our second mistake is now we've just offended our most marginalized families by wagging our fingers at them. When really the problem is, well, if I had a living, you know, if I had a living wage job, then maybe I would have paid leave or a more flexible schedule. But I'm working two or three jobs. I work at night. I work a wage job, so I can't take time off. I don't have transportation. I can't afford childcare. I get treated shittily. I think I just made up a word, shittily. I get treated shittily when I do come into the school. And. Uh, and so you're blaming me for something that really is not my fault. Deficit ideology is that sort of blame the victim mentality. Secondly is, uh, oh, I didn't know I had some insights for this, great ideology. So great ideology is a form of deficit ideology. This is kind of the new ideology on the block. Great ideology is sort of, we recognize that some, now if I have deficit ideology, I'm pretty much pretending that there are no structural barriers. If I, if I have deficit ideology, I have to ignore all those things I just said about challenges and barriers. I have to ignore structural racism, heterosexism, ableism, sexism, all of that. I have to just pretend none of that exists. And if any of you are still using, I keep having on Ruby Payne here, it's sort of fun. But if, if you have co a copy of, uh, whatever, some of you have no idea who I'm talking about, but if you do know, the, she wrote this book on a framework for understanding poverty. It's the most popular as the most popular model that's used across the country to prepare teachers to learn about class and poverty. And if you go back and look at it, she just doesn't even mention structural barriers 
that low-income people and, and people of color experience. She doesn't mention lack of access to transportation, that, that I have to work three jobs, that the kids might be coming to school hungry. She just doesn't even mention it. She just doesn't even mention it. Great ideology is, I might recognize some, I might mention some of those barriers, but instead of removing the barriers, my approach is to make marginalized students more gritty and resilient so they can overcome the barriers. So they can overcome the barriers, by the way, they should not be experiencing to begin with. And you, I mean, y'all probably know great ideology comes from uh, Angela Duckworth and her work. And what's really instructive, first of all, she never applied grit theory in this way, the ways that schools are doing it now, saying, well, we're just going to make our low-income students more gritty. First of all, your most marginalized students are already your most gritty and resilient students. <laughs> but the other thing about this is, so, it, it, and, and um, I can't remember if this is in a book or one of our articles, she tells this story about, uh, this is Duckworth, who came up with this whole grit notion or she borrowed from other scholars to put together this great notion. So she tells a story about, in her family, the way they cultivate grit is at any one time, each person in the family is focusing on one thing that they want to accomplish that's challenging for them. Each person in the family chooses one thing at a time, and that's sort of what grit theory says. You gotta focus on, really focus on one thing at a time. How many students of color, low-income students, English language learners in schools do you know that is facing one challenge at a time in their lives, or one barrier at a time in their lives. But the, so the grit is the new learning styles, I think, in essence. Grit is the thing all these schools are embracing uh, because it's, a, it's an easy uh, answer. I, I'll give you, uh, I don't really have time, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna give you uh, a, a gender example of this because I think it captures the problem of grit ideology really well. When I was in Minnesota, I was te teaching at a little university called Hamlin University, and I got a call from one of the local legislators, and she says, we're having this problem in the middle schools uh, around sexual assault. And so I, we talked a little bit more about it, and it turns out that they found this sort of dramatic increase in male-on-female, student-on-student sexual assault in the middle schools. Uh, in parts of Minnesota. So I said, well, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. What can we do about it? So she said, well, we're developing this uh, bill that we're gonna propose and we really want your support. So I said, well, what's the bill? She said, what we're gonna do is require that all um, young women in the middle school take self-defense class as part of their physical education. Okay, some of you seem pretty pissed off by this idea. The rest of you ought to be pissed off by this idea. It's a shame on you. Um, so great ideology, right? We're not actually going to address the problem of sexual assault. We're just going to try to make the young women more resilient against the sexual assault that they're probably going to experience because we're not doing anything about the actual sexual assault. Right? That's great ideology. And it seems very obvious when, we're, when I use that example. But what about all of the microaggressions and then bigger structural racism that students of color experience in our schools? How do we think that, and how do we think, for instance, that just, let's just implement a mentoring program. How do we think that mentoring programs are, if they're done in place of equity work, that's a grit program. That's grit ideology. Instead of, this is very, many of you in higher ed, in the higher ed field. You all know about this. This is often what happens for recruitment and retention programs in higher ed. Is that, first of all, even if you're at a K-12 private school where you're doing you know, recruiting students and, and faculty, the best way to recruit and retain students and faculty of color is to eliminate racism. That's the best way to do it. In fact, that's pretty much the only way to do it. But what do most institutions do? They just pretend the racism doesn't exist and then they sort of mitigate the racism through this through a mentoring program. Now, I think if the mentoring program is designed by people who are being marginalized to support each other, to get through the marginalization, that's one thing. But if the institution's only response to racism is we're going to require people of color to do even more work 
to mentor other people of color uh, so that they can better cope with the racism that both the mentors and the mentees are experiencing. In our, so you can see how that works. That's grit ideology. If we want to make a difference, we've got to make our way to structural ideology. Structural ideology is we work on recognizing the barriers, and then we remove the barriers. Now here's the challenge with structural ideology, is that in some ways there are two sets of barriers. There are the barriers that exist within a school or a district. We might say, okay, we have the power to remove those. There are other barriers that exist outside of the education system. Excuse me, that, but that might impact students' experiences in, like wealth inequality, structural racism, those sorts of things, structural uh, sexism, those sorts of things that happen outside of schools, right? How many of you can afford to buy a car for every low-income family in your school or district? Right, so that might be a little bit outside our sphere of influence. So we might not be able to completely remove that barrier, but we could do our planning and our initiative creating. We could do that based on an understanding of that barrier. So that when we look at well, why these gaps in family involvement, we could say, well, maybe we need to, maybe we should stop scheduling family involvement in ways that assume everyone can afford childcare, nobody works at night, everyone has transportation, that sort of thing. Structural, how many of you can afford to buy a computer for every student? Maybe you can't afford to do that, but what you can do when your school says, well, we're going to go to all online communication with families, you can say, well, wait a second, who's that policy for? What about our families that don't have computers or internet access? So these policies that create more opportunity for the people with the most opportunity and take away opportunity for the people with the least opportunity, we can speak up about that. I'll give you uh, other examples. So there's no other way to do this than that structural approach. There's no other way to do it. Grid approach, the grid and deficit approach basically are just new layers of oppression in essence. And so we gotta take the structural view. Uh, next concept is interest convergence theory. Anybody familiar with this term, interest convergence? Comes out of uh, critical race theory. Although I think it can, be, uh, it can be tied to any sort of identity issue. But the idea basically with interest convergence theory is that white people are willing to invest in conversations about race and racial justice as long as their interests converge with the interests of racial justice. So that's why we see a lot of dialogue programs, we see a lot of celebrating diversity. Because once you start getting to talking about structural racism, and we're going to have to redistribute some of your access and opportunity so that other people have more access and opportunity. Now my interests have diverged from the interests of racial justice, and that's where most white people go running the other direction. You could do, you could, I could do that same whole thing around gender or any other, uh, any other uh, issue. Uh, part of what's happening with interest convergence theory is related to the notion of white liberalism. This is what Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about in that quote several slides back, where we conflate racial harmony with racial justice. That there is no real racial harmony. With why would people experiencing racism want racial harmony with people who are oppressing them? Why would they want that? And that's the problem with it, like mix it up at lunch and those kinds of programs. That's the problem with dialogue programs, where people think, oh, well, if I just have the dialogue, that's the action. I've done my activism just by participating in the dialogue. That's another one, the conflation of dialogue and action. If we just get together and have the conversation, then magically everything changes. And of course, that's another example of white people getting the opportunity to build their knowledge and cultural capital on the backs of people of color while not actually doing racial justice work. Conflation of comfort and progress, where our equity initiatives, where we are primarily concerned with making sure people in privileged groups stay comfortable and safe. And we're more concerned with having racial justice initiatives that make white people safe than we are dealing with the fact that none of the students of color, or maybe even teachers of color in our school ever feel safe. So we're, we're putting the temporary comfort of white people ahead of the overall comfort and safety of people who are racially marginalized. 
and, and that's sort of that last point too. The final uh, concept, and I'm going to connect these to, to sort of ways to assess your, your diversity and equity programs is knowing the difference between mitigative equity work and transformative equity work. How many of you know the starfish parable? Okay, so there's a kid walking on, give me the short version. There's a child walking on the beach and sees all these dried out starfish and she's picking up the starfish one by one, throwing them back in the ocean. And an adult comes along and says, there's thousands of starfish drying out, you're never gonna make a difference. And she says, well, I made a difference to this one and throws it back in the ocean. Does anybody get the warm fuzzies? That? <laughs> Such a beautiful rendition of the starfish story. Part of the problem is that in the US, we're socialized to think that that's how social change happens. The truth is no social change has ever happened that way. No social change has ever happened by picking up one marginalized person one by one and throwing them back in the ocean. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do that where we have the opportunity to do that, uh, because we should. And this, you know, I had a teacher who basically saved my life and I was the starfish. Sort of getting emotional. <laughs> I was the starfish, and he was the thrower of the starfish. But he was also working on the structural things in that school that were oppressive to me. And that was critically important as well. What we want to do is, uh, anyone know the babies floating down the river story? This isn't Moses, it's a whole different baby. <laughs> okay, let's keep religion out of this. So there's a baby floating down the river, a young woman standing on the riverbed, and she swims out and grabs the baby and puts the baby in the grass, and then another baby's floating down the river. So she swims out, grabs the baby, puts the baby in the grass. And the more time she does that, the more babies are floating down the river. And the next thing you know, the entire village is at the river, and everyone's swimming, grabbing babies, putting them in the grass. And then the young woman, who saved the first baby, starts walking up the river, and everyone's furious. Where are you going? We've got to save the babies. And she says, I'm going to go figure out how all these babies keep ending up in the river. <laughs> that's, how, that's how change happens. That's how change happens. What are the root causes of the inequity? What are the root causes of the inequity? And how do we address those root causes? What are the root causes so that we're not just sort of Explaining things as symptoms of the root causes. What are the root causes? In essence, like I said here, you can't mitigate your way to, to, to uh, equity. You can't mitigate your way. You know, I, I think about, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends who work on issues of like child slavery. And, it's, and you know, they always tell the story about where you have these organizations, these nonprofits, uh, these uh, Western nonprofits that are in different parts of Africa. And basically what they're trying to do is make life more comfortable for child slaves. Make life more comfortable for child slaves. And you know who likes that more than anybody are mostly the chocolate and coffee corporations who someone else is caring for their child slaves. That's who's getting the most out of that. Now the problem isn't that they're doing that. I always say, because I do a lot of work around poverty and homelessness, the idea is not to work on structural issues while people who are homeless right now starve to death and freeze to death. So we have to do some of that mitigative stuff. The problem is, if everybody's handing out blankets to people who are homeless and nobody's working on the bigger structural issues, then we're going to spend the rest of our lives handing out clothing to people who are homeless. And same thing around uh, how this stuff operates uh, in schools. And so, uh, so again, the equity literacy, a big part of the equity literacy is just learning how to see, learning how to see these dynamics so that we can respond to them in these transformative ways. So think about this. And the question here, the question here is, do you see it? Could you see it? Because if you can't see it, you can't respond to it. So think about policies that punish marginalized students basically for being marginalized students. We have, we have students who are lesbian, gay, queer identifying students all over the country all the time who are being suspended for missing class 
and missing school, when they're missing class and missing school because their schools aren't protecting them from the violence they're experiencing in school. So those kids are being punished for the school's lack of attention to equity and justice. Low-income students who are, be, who are punished by tardy, inflexible tardy policies, or who have prevent, preventable diseases like asthma, and they're missing school because of that. And then they get punished for missing school because as a society, we have agreed that they don't deserve preventive health care. These exist in every district. Your job is to go back and check it out. And even you can do that at a, at a classroom level. Think about homework. And this is the difference between equality and equity. Homework, is, you know, equality is, well, I'm going to grade everyone on homework. I'm going to grade them equally. I'm going to do the same amount of points. But that's not always equitable for the low-income kids who have to take care of younger siblings after school or have to go work after school to help take care of their families. They aren't doing their homework because they're doing being responsible. And then they're getting punished for being responsible. Right. So we got to look at those sorts of things. Practices that humiliate marginalized students. How many of you have ever been in a school? Damn, I'm starting to depress myself up here. How many of you have uh, been in a school or worked at a school where uh, kids were doing a fundraiser where they had to sell stuff? Bad chocolate, ugly candles, whatever. <laughs> Okay. And then usually how these things work is whoever sells the most bad chocolate or ugly candles wins some kind of prize, right? Y'all know that's humiliating to low-income students, right? I mean, that's a setup. That is set up to guarantee that the people with the most privilege end up getting more privilege. Low-income kids cannot go walk around their neighborhoods asking people for money they don't have for chocolate they don't want to eat. I don't know about the, the candles. I don't know what anybody does with those candles, but... What about book fairs? I was in elementary school just a couple months ago, and there were, you know, those scholastic book fairs? So they were having a scholastic book fair. They just happened to be having it while I was there. And I said, oh, well, and, and they wanted to talk to me about it, because they said, we know we're going to march the kids through the book fair, and we know our wealthier kids are going to be able to afford to buy stuff, and the low-income kids aren't going to afford to buy anything. And they're trying to figure out what to do. To their credit, what are we going to do? And uh, so one of their ideas was, we'll, we'll just give the low-income kids a voucher. So they, can, they don't have to pay money, and they can just use a voucher. And we had this whole conversation about asking students to perform their poverty. Right? Uh, like when we send kids on free and reduce lunch through a different line. Or, or we go around and say, let's talk about what we did on summer vacation. These sorts of things where we're asking students to perform their poverty. So, uh, oh my goodness, I'm so far behind right now. Uh, so, I asked them to show me the book fair. So, where do you think the book fair was? In the library. So, I say, well, what happens to the library during the book fair? And they say, well, we close the library during the book fair. So, let me understand this. In order to get the students with the most access to books, more access to books, we're going to shut off access to books to the kids with the least access to books. Does that sound like a good strategy there? Now, here's what's horrifying about this. Because I bet this happened in schools y'all have worked in. Here's the thing. And that school full of caring adults, couldn't anybody see that? They've been doing it that way for 15 years. That's what they told me. I said, in 15 years, nobody figured out why this is problematic. That's why equity literacy is important. How are you going to fix this way that low-income kids are humiliated if you can't even see it? If you can't even see it. So the first task is learning how to see. And then, of course, there are uh, sort of diversity or intercultural programs that force marginalized students to teach about their experiences with no guarantee that the marginalization will be uh, addressed. Uh, we talked about that earlier. So I'm going to sort of uh, uh, summarize all of this. And the four guidelines that you can use to assess your equity practice, maybe it's in a classroom, maybe it's in a school, maybe it's in a district, maybe it's your own personal practice, maybe it's the school's or district's practice. Now, this kind of repeats all this stuff that I said, but it puts it in a 
four easy guidelines that will eliminate oppression in every school. Now, th these are, uh, that, that of course does not exist. Uh, these are about us as equity people holding ourselves accountable for what we say we want to be doing in our schools. And I, I've already mentioned most of these before, but guideline number one, who or what are we trying to fix? Are our equity efforts focused on fixing marginalized people or on fixing the inequitable conditions that marginalize people? If it's the former, start over. There is no equity initiative that is focused on fixing the people who are experiencing the inequity. That's like the inverse of an equity initiative. Okay? So you can use that as a measuring stick. Go back and look at your equity practice. Do we mitigate or do we transform? Are, are our equity efforts a threat to the existence of inequity? Or do they merely mitigate the symptoms of inequity? And I use the recruitment and retention example there. Again, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do some of the mitigative stuff because we can't, you know, while we're working on the revolution, we got to address the smaller stuff as, as we go along. But if all of our equity energy is going into these little mitigations while we're ignoring the inequities that are creating the problems that we're just responding to in little ways, then we never create more equitable schools. Are we dancing around or are we digging in? Are our equity efforts contributing to the permanent redistribution of access and opportunity? Or are they leaving the current distribution in place and helping marginalized people be a little bit more comfortable as marginalized people? As so much equity work and diversity work and service and volunteerism is mostly all involved in doing that sort of stuff. Finally, guideline number four. Are our equity efforts based on collaborations with marginalized people deferring to their expertise? Are we working on marginalized people or are we walking with and in solidarity with marginalized people? If our equity efforts are about working on marginalized people as opposed to deferring to the expertise of marginalized people, then it's time to rethink what we're doing. A few really quick things that we can do. I mentioned spending my institutional likability. Uh, the more dimensions of your identity that are privileged dimensions, the more institutional likability you begin with. Because again, I know what I say up here, if I was a person of color saying the same thing, if I went into an, an office of a superintendent and said the same thing as a person of color, it would be heard completely differently. So that gives me an extra responsibility to say, I'm going to take some of the blowback on myself. I'm going to go in and do this. I'm going to say the hard stuff, right, in solidarity with. So I'm going to spend my likability, even if it makes me unliked. Likability in that sense is a kind of currency. It's a kind of currency attached to whiteness or maleness or heterosexuality, or um, et cetera. Always put justice ahead of harmony. Expecting harmony without justice is a form of injustice. So diversity programs are about celebrating diversity and building, har uh, building harmony across groups. There's no way that those can be authentic if we're not addressing the injustice. Address bigger issues. If you want to expand your sphere of influence, privatization, high stakes testing, uh, resurgence of segregation in schools. If you want to go even bigger, income and wealth inequality, equal distribution of healthcare. Because these things hurt the most marginalized students the hardest. Right, these are those things that might seem like they're outside your sphere of influence. Engage in policy review. A lot of inequities are buried in policy and practice in very implicit ways. So we, gotta, we have to do that. And every time we create a new policy, we need to ask ourselves, in whose image are we creating this? How is this going to affect our most marginalized students and families? Finally, transcending the dialogic service. Dialogue is, is important because it helps us prepare for activism. Dialogue is not activism in and of itself. So it's not enough to have the conversation. In fact, in a way, having the conversation without the action, that's just more privilege. 
And I'm going to go get some education about this, but I'm not going to use it uh, for any sort of action. So transcending the dialogic service. So just as a final reflection here, I hope this is what you can take back with you and a question you can raise in your schools, in your districts. Look at the initiatives you have around diversity. Look at the ways that you spend and distribute your time when it comes to advocacy and equity and diversity and social justice and even inclusive excellence. And ask yourself, ask yourself, am I a threat to equity? Or am I a threat to the possibility of inequity? Because I'm doing things that I'm calling equity that are really no threat to inequity. That should be the central commitment of, of uh, all of us here. Now, um, I've been told that instead of, uh, instead of doing a Q&A sort of thing, we're going to ask you all to uh, do some reflection at your tables to present it. Uh, and so, how long do we want to do that? Okay, we'll take care of it. What's up? Oh yeah, and then after that, after you do that, uh, the small group thing, then I'll hang out for a bit if anybody wants to chat. So, thank you all so much. It was really fun. <laughs>